And hello, everybody. So I am here to talk about something that I think is um, maybe not as uh, interesting as ticks, or at least some people think not, uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit about the bacteriology or, or what the bacteria are doing with regard to Lyme disease. Um, and so with that, um, I think that, first of all, I'd really like to thank the Dutchess County Tick Task Force for inviting me to participate in the webinar. I think that most people are pretty aware that ticks are the vectors of infectious diseases and that stopping ticks from biting is most certainly a way to decrease human risk, and that is probably the focus, the main focus of this webinar. However, the ticks are, um, I'm not, my slide is not moving, advancing, because I need to click on it. There we go. Um, Lyme disease is, uh, a bacterial infection, and so ticks are only half the problem. The other half is actually microbiological. Lyme disease is an infectious disease caused by a bacterium named Borrelia burgdorferi, and at this time there is really a deficit in the medical understanding of the remarkable biology of these bacteria, which underlies their ability to cause chronic disease. So it is a bacterial infection. I, as far as their um, lifestyle is concerned, Borrelia and other species are commensals, which means that they want to get along with their hosts. Uh, commensals is a term that I will define in uh, more detail in a second. But these are zoonotic types of bacteria. In other words, they live in animals. They survive and reproduce in animals, in many cases without causing any diseases, such as in mice. And they are uh, able to do this in a multitude of different types of hosts, which because each animal, uh, and then I'm including insects with that, or excuse me, the, the ticks, which are arachnids with that, uh, they are able to survive all of these different types of exposures to the, human, to the immune response. And that is actually a remarkable feat that very few bacteria are able to achieve. So what is a commensal? It is an organism that lives with another. And in fact, the term commensal is defined as share the table. So commensals share the table with their host. Um, vertebrate animals, such as us, we all have uh, an immune system that is built in to defend us from infectious disease. It is designed to distinguish between self and non-self. And if a non-self entity is found, our immune system attacks those things that don't belong in order to defend us and protect us from disease. So if you're going to be a commensal organism and not considered a harm causer, which would trigger the immune system to try to destroy you, the bacteria have to come to some sort of terms with their host immune systems. And they do that through what I refer to dialogue. This is actually just cellular uh, communication, molecular communication, and sort of negotiate a truce so that they are perceived as being friend and not foe so that they don't get attacked. Now, how exactly does Borrelia do this? Um, there are a multitude of different biological strategies that these bacteria do. They are ancient bacteria. They've been uh, at this for a very long time, evolving within, with animal hosts for a long time before humans ever showed up. So some of the strategies they use, which I'm listing here for you to look at, have all been shown to, in several published studies over many, many years, these are all characteristics of Borrelia that allow them to be commensals, that allow them to share the table. So they actually can delay the early immune responses by uh, tapping into their tick's ability, the, the tick vector's ability to, um, you know, kind of convince our immune system to allow them to bite and to stay attached. They completely subvert the, the late uh, host immune responses because that would be the type of response that could eliminate them. They have different morphological forms. Uh, one form, the spirochete form, which is the best known of the different forms, allow them to be highly modal uh, and highly agile, allowing them to not only uh, spread from one place to another in the body, but also to uh, make it into areas of the body um, such as joint capsules and the central nervous system, which are quite 
literally protected um, from immune surveillance. So these are protected niches that, hi that allow them to hide out um, in plain sight within the body. They are known to engage in quorum sensing and biofilm behaviors, meaning they're talking to each other and they act as a block in many cases, which is why they are uh, able to know when ticks are feeding and go get themselves uh, fucked up, so to speak. And they, they alter their morphological or their um, immunological markers. The things that are found on the surfaces of the bacteria change with the changing forms of the bacteria. And most recently uh, pro shown for the first time is that the Borrelia have the ability to produce persister cells, which means these are non-reproducing types of cells, literally quite dormant, and they just sit there until they perceive that it is time to reemerge. Um, so in other words, that allows them to survive catastrophic events, which in the case of a bacteria would be antibiotic exposure. So these are non-reproducing, dormant types of cells that are the ultimate survivors. So if they're commensals of animals, um, then why are they, why is it possible for them to cause harm in some hosts? So it's not just humans, of course, it's dogs and horses and cows and others can actually get diseases from uh, being, having these bacteria transmitted to them. And the answer is because although they want to share the table and get along, that doesn't always work out in a host uh, which is considered the dead end host. So in other words, they end up in uh, higher vertebrates such as ourselves and they haven't completed the requisite negotiations to convince the immune system that they should be tolerated. So we are uh, humans and dogs and certain other animal horses, for example, are considered alternative hosts for Borrelia and, in fact, the other tick-borne microbes that Dr. Ostel was just talking about. Um, they once in us as an alternative host, the rules of engagement of commensalism change. And as a result, Borrelia becomes a frustrated commensal. And frustrated commensalism occurs when basically the negotiations haven't been complete yet. So coexistence is not necessarily peaceful. It is not the same as an all-out attack. But on the other hand, um, the two parties don't necessarily uh, get along. Frustrated commensalism and many other types of bacteria is known to result in persistent inflammation um, because that, that inflammation is a, a basic in, inborn type of response that is just, uh, you know, the immune system says, I don't really know what else to do, so I'm just going to set the place on fire trying to stop the infection. And so inflammation leads to further inflammation, which leads to further inflammation. So it can cause persistent and chronic inflammation in hosts that are not adapted to the commensal state. And I don't think it's necessary at this point, uh, it's well established that pretty much all chronic diseases in humans um, are due to persistent inflammation. And that includes chronic diseases such as heart disease, it includes diabetes, uh, multiple sclerosis, other chronic diseases. The underlying pathology is persistent inflammation. So just a brief refresher on um, how infection with a microorganism can lead to disease. Most infectious diseases that people are very familiar with, such as strep throat, uh, the bacteria that cause those enter the body with a mission to reproduce themselves. They invade, they reproduce as quickly as they can because their goal is to spread to other hosts. That's how they survive. To do that, they deploy an arsenal of different types of virulence factors, which are, uh, can be, in fact, quite damaging to the host. So this is sort of this overt or frontal approach results in acute disease symptoms that are very recognizable. And in fact, um, medicine, modern medicine was built on the recognition that bacteria can cause acute diseases and antibiotics can cure those things. However, that is one approach, and then there are other commensals that are particularly those that are frustrated commensals, like Borrelia. They use that diplomacy and espionage approach because they want to be commensals, but 
So what they're trying to do is to evade or subvert the immune response to get themselves tolerated. And this very subversive approach is referred to as stealth pathogenicity. It's a stealthy approach that can result in chronic disease as, again, has been well established with other types of stealth bacteria um, such as Bartonella and Coxiella. So here's some of the differences uh, to compare the two approaches, if you will, for infections, frontal versus stealth pathogenicity. You can see that there are fundamental and profound differences between the types of infectious disease, the disease state that results after exposure to these two different types of pathogens. So a frontal pathogen is what we know best in terms of infectious disease medicine or just medicine in general. Stealth pathogenicity uh, we know less about. The symptoms are chronic. The duration is long. Immunity does not, is non-sterilizing. Uh, generally speaking, transmission requires a vector. They reproduce slowly. Their goal is not to spread out and bathe and get transmitted. It's more of a stealthy approach. And it is often uh, is very common uh, to have a carrier state develop as a result of that. Now, unfortunately, most medical approaches to infectious diseases are geared for frontal pathogens. Um, and that includes antibiotics and other approaches, but there is little research to guide what to do about diseases that are caused by stealth pathogens. So looking at Lyme disease from two perspectives, um, there is both an acute and a stealth phase to Lyme disease infection. And when you look at Lyme disease uh, as a, from the medical perspective, it is kind of delineated into three stages. There's a primary stage, there's a middle stage called disseminated, and then there's a persistent stage, or stage three. The primary stage is the acute manifestation of Lyme disease. It is mostly associated with nymph stage ticks um, because there is often a time where the, uh, a rash, a particular type of rash called an erythema migrans, which is a spreading red rash, uh, will emerge that is a recognizable symptom of the disease. Often there is flu or other acute disease symptoms um, that goes along with that. And at the moment, that is the form of the disease that is diagnosed, uh, diagnosable or defined, if you will, as Lyme disease. Then uh, for the disseminate and persistent stages, the primary stage doesn't last long. The bacteria do not wish to remain in your skin. They do not wish to remain in your bloodstream. They try to find protected niches that would allow them to survive longer. And so there is, there are these more chronic manifestations of them. Generally speaking, it's not associated with a particular life stage. Tick bites may or may not have been noticed. Um, most times there is not a bullseye-shaped rash. There may be a rash about half the time, but it's less than 10% of the time it appears as the classic bullseye appearing that everybody recognizes as being a sign of Lyme disease. The symptoms appear not acute as acute symptoms, but more along the lines of a chronic inflammatory disease, which are vague and can be vague and nonspecific. And so there is no disease diet, uh, definition for this form. It's instead referred to as medically unexplained symptoms. Now, there is consensus among all groups that some Lyme disease patients experience these uh, symptoms of chronic inflammatory disease due to the disseminated and persistent stages of, of the bacteria. There is consensus that dissemination and persistence of Borrelia actually occur, but where there is no consensus and in fact there is great debate is whether the dissemination and persistence of Borrelia is actually responsible for the chronic inflammatory disease symptoms. And that actually is the heart of the matter when it comes to Lyme disease because uh, the numbers of people affected and also whether or not these medically unexplained symptoms can be explained by bacterial infection are still under debate. So there are two major questions that that are at the heart of the problem. Question number one is, what, why do some people have chronic inflammatory disease following infection with Borrelia? Not everybody develops this. Why do some develop it while others do not? 
And the other is, are antibiotics an effective way to reduce the symptoms of chronic inflammation associated with disseminated and persistent Borrelia infection? So the first question, what causes some people to have chronic inflammatory disease, would be that there are three hypotheses that would help explain that. They are that the inflammation is due to uh, what is referred to as autoimmune response, uh, irreversible post-infection sequelae, meaning your body decides to attack parts of yourself because it has been tricked into thinking those things are bad. This is known to occur following other diseases such as streptococcus um, because st some forms of streptococcus can also cause rheumatoid arthritis or rheumatic heart disease. Number two is that the immune system defeats the spirochetes or antibiotics kill the spirochetes. And so the chronic inflammation is due to the dead bits of bacteria that are remaining in the tissues after the treatment. And the third hypothesis is that there exist persister survivalist forms of Borrelia that are actually part of an ongoing infection. So the infection is a live infection, not just um, you know, some, a remnant of a previous infectious disease. And so to test all three of these hypotheses, there have been studies done on all of them, um, but the one that would lead to uh, con confirmation of hypothesis number three is the recovery of culturable Borrelia, in other words, recovering live bacteria, or the DNA, RNA, or proteins of the bacteria, which would indicate cellular activity by them, from infected animals or humans after antibiotic treatment. So what I would like to do is to talk about the results of a webinar, a special webinar that was convened in May of 2014 uh, to discuss this. Uh, it was convened by the CDC, uh, supported by Health and Human Services in the United States, and essentially it was a review of the scientific evidence as to whether or not persisting infection could be the cause of chronic inflammation um, for Lyme disease. So as a course, part of that rep webinar, there were both NIH-supported and um, uh, privately supported researchers that were convened to talk about that, human and veterinarian. And here are some of the outcomes of that, which would, uh, when you look down the list of those things, it is that research, the available research right now shows these following things, that Borrelia can survive for months to years in ticks without any kind of nutrient replenishment. They don't reproduce. They remain dormant. Borrelia cause infections that persist after antibiotic treatment in a variety of different animals. So at this point, the mice, rats, hamster, guinea pigs, gerbils, dogs, and two different species of non-human primates, which are considered the best models of human disease. Pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine responses are seen in persistently infected animals, which literally means inflammation. So the cytokines are chemicals that are produced that are part of the inflammatory response. We can measure those chemicals. They are found in persistently infected animals. Borrelia DNA, RNA, and proteins have been are recovered from infected animals that have been treated with antibiotics. And I think most remarkable is that live, culturable spirochetes of Borrelia can be recovered from animals and from humans excuse me, by, di by xenodiagnosis, which is literally where you take naive ticks and allow them to feed on humans and then test the ticks to see if there are Borrelia. And so this has been done in animals, and it was most recently done in humans, and there were culturable spirochetes recovered. So I think that one of the most significant findings is from Tulane University w using non-human uh, primates where both culturable spirochetes and Borrelia DNA can be infect recovered from infected monkeys that were treated with doxycycline at concentrations that far exceeded the human dosages. In fact, do dosages that would be toxic to humans, recoverable spirochetes were found in those monkeys. So all of these provide very strong evidence that there is such a thing as persisting infection after antibiotic treatment for uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. The larger question is, is the way to treat chronic inflammation 
the antibiotics. And there are pros and cons on that. And just at, from the biological perspective, it is known already that persisters are going to persist and that biofilms protect bacteria when they are exposed to antibiotics. So these things are going to be very difficult. These forms will be very difficult to eradicate with antibiotics. Antibiotics are damaging to animals that have symbionts. They damage our microbiome, and they can also damage mitochondria because mitochondria have uh, many aspects of bacteria in them. There have been studies over the years to see if uh, there is improvement in inflammatory symptoms uh, with antibiotics. And most recent, there have been four NIH-funded clinical trials, but those clinical trials had contradictory results. And generally speaking, of the four trials, two were poorly designed, and the two that were actually that are uh, well designed, one showed improvement and one showed no improvement, and they were looking at completely different areas. So at the moment, there is insufficient evidence to support or reject the use of antibiotics. So their uh, lack of evidence should not be taken as evidence in this case. So whether or not antibiotics are should be considered a treatment for chronic inflammation induced by Borrelia, the jury is still out on that, and more research needs to be done. Now, most recently, also an article uh, that was published um, with researchers from Johns Hopkins University, they were looking at different types of antibiotics that might be used against Borrelia burgdorferi. And these studies were done in, on cultured bacteria. And they showed clearly the persister forms of the bacteria that early on in the culture, which is what happens in infection as well, the spirochete form of Borrelia burgdorferi were found. And then over time, they become persistent states. They dominate later in the culture. The persistent forms were not susceptible to the frontline antibiotics, doxycycline and amoxicillin, which are currently used as uh, treatments for acute Borrelia burgdorferi infection. So the persisters persisted, regardless of antibiotic treatment. And lastly, something promising was that there, uh, with very co different combinations of FDA-approved compounds, which were mostly antibacterial or antifungal type products, they were able to show that there is activity against the persistent forms. In other words, they were able to kill the per persisters. However, this was all done in a in vitro environment. So this was done in culture, but not necessarily uh, you know, having to test these out. And humans would require more clinical trials, and that has not been done. So to briefly summarize, um, Dr. Lyndon Yu from Tufts University in the HHS webinar, I, I, he, he said this out loud. And I think that it sums up exactly the state of bacteriology for this organism. Brilliant is not breaking the rules of infection. We just don't actually understand all the rules. And the larger context is that microbiological studies moving forward should address the fact that these persister cells are present, that they produce biofilms, and that needs to be addressed, and look for more solutions uh, to addressing these alternative forms because uh, Borrelia is shown to persist. So thanks very much for listening. And I, it is now my duty to introduce the next presenter. Uh, the next presenter is Mason Kaufman of US Biologic, who is going to be talking about stopping Lyme disease in its tracks. Thank you very much. And I'm honored to be with each of you this morning. And uh, I'd like to pass on a sincere compliment to Dutchess County for putting together such an informative uh, session this morning. Uh, I live in this world every day, and I've quite frankly been very impressed with what I've learned with the previous presenters today, and I certainly look forward to enjoying the rest of them, of course, you know, during the course of the, uh, the webinar. So with that said, uh, we have a promising new technology that I'd like to uh, just introduce to you uh, this morning, 
Um, when you look at integrated pest management, I think Dr. Stafford did an excellent job of providing an overview of all the proven uh, disease prevention methods up to date. Uh, certainly there's education in behavioral as far as tick checks and more protective clothing, changing of landscaping, uh, baiting host control, and then vector control of the ticks. And those have been the established solutions to date, and, and they're all very important errors in our quivers. But to date, we've also seen a steady increase in the prevalence of Lyme disease. So what we're introducing as another error in the quiver is disease prevention, whereby with Lyme Shield, we're able to actually take the bacteria out of the cycle of transmission, and I'll explain how that works during the course of my presentation. Uh, and I think one important point of this slide before we move on is that every single solution is an important part of the overall Lyme prevention solution. So what we're bringing to date is just a new error in the quiver that hopefully will be another promising new technology to protect the residents of New York and Dutchess County. One gentleman that I've always been very impressed with is Representative Chris Gibson. We uh, presented together at the Mohawk House uh, last, last year. And when you look at his passion to come through with not only state initiatives but national initiatives to help control the growing Lyme epidemic, uh, leaders like that have been emerging and we're meeting more and more every day as we continue our correspondence with the state of New York as well as the national offices for New York and the other states. And what I'm going to try to do is, is focus in just a little bit more specifically on, on uh, New York today and specifically on Dutchess County. We look at the CDC records, but we also look at each state's individual records. And in this case, the New York uh, State Department of Health recorded 7,587 cases in 2013 of Lyme disease. And then again, like it's been shared earlier in the conversation, the CDC estimates that that number is probably underreported by a factor of 10. So if that assumption is right, then New York would actually have over 75,000 new cases of Lyme disease every year, which is obviously very significant and very alarming. The next slide that's on right now will give you the New York Department of Public Health distribution of reported Lyme cases by county. And you can see as a circle with Duchess, Duchess is a hotbed, unfortunately, for the Lyme bacteria. So where you have 427 cases there, which could be over 4,000 potentially, you know, that's where we would love to partner with the county to actually try to reduce that to as close to zero as, as technically possible. And the slide that you've seen earlier shared by Dr. Stafford that gives the age distribution, that's really a pertinent slide for a couple of different reasons. The ones that Dr. Stafford and the others shared earlier, but if children are the most at risk for getting Lyme disease because they're out dressed in shorts and, and uh, unprotected clothing, maybe more so than other adults, and they're outside more so in many cases, if they contract Lyme disease and if there is a persistent uh, ongoing uh, condition, then in essence when you're looking at the cost, somebody might have to uh, pay for Lyme medical costs for 10 years, 50 years, 60 years, a long time of life. So it's not a one-time medical expenditure. In some cases it could be a lifelong and so that's important to realize who's getting it and where they're getting it in their, their age life cycle. If you look at the cost of Lyme disease specifically for New York, we were working with the uh, Department of Health records we shared earlier, which was the 7,587 cases. With the uh, CDC's 10X estimate, it's the 75,000 we discussed earlier. Now, the most recent study by the CDC uh, brought up to $2014 for medical costs, indirect medical costs, lost income, lost taxes, other associated Lyme disease costs, 
$10,769 per case. And this is interesting because the more recent John Hopkins study that was medical costs only actually mirrored their exact cost that they had done previously. So when you take that medical cost with the other associate costs, that's where the $10,769 per case comes from. So you do the math, the 75000 times the 10000 it comes up to $817 million, obviously an exceptionally high number. But for sake of discussion, let's discount that by 90% and call it $80 million, or you could continue discounting it. And the bottom line is it's a very significant challenge for not only Dutchess County, but uh, the state of New York. And we've also talked several times during the course of this morning about the NIFTIC and how integral it is into the disease transmission cycle. And I'll just make one follow-on point with this slide. If you look at the NIFTIC, sometimes when we say the average yard might have a 1,000 ticks in the backyard or whatever that number could be, you have to appreciate that you can put 200 of those nymph ticks inside of that paper clip. So that's the challenge. It's not necessarily the adults. It's the nymphs and how active they are and how small they are and how difficult they are to find on a pet, you know, or a human. And as far as Lyme disease prevalence in New York, let me cite uh, three recent studies. One is the five-year CDC-sponsored field trial that was carried on at the Cary Institute in Millbrook. Actually, uh, it was headed by Dr. Maria gomes lecky but Dr. Rick Osfeld actually led the field trials and was a co-author in that very impactful study. And what they did is they studied the level of infection in ticks prior to the study and then after the study on an annual basis. And they found the average infection rate was 28%, which is obviously significant. But even more so, the U.S. Army just released an uh, updated study. And in the, the series of bases that they checked for tick infection, they found that the infected ticks ranged anywhere from 19.7% up to over 37%. And then, working recently with Fort Drum up in New York, uh, they reported a 40% average infection rate of the ticks that they actually collected off the soldiers. So this is a great opportunity. If we can find a way to reduce the level of Borrelia in these ticks, that's the goal that you know our, our technology is targeted at achieving. When you talk about breaking the cycle, here's exactly how Lime Shield works. We've talked a lot this morning about the mice or the mouse being the primary reservoir for uh, passing the Lyme Borrelia. And then the tick is the vector that actually passes it on to a pet or a human. So that is the cycle, the supply chain of uh, Lyme disease, if you will. And what Dr. gomes Selecki did is she realized that Instead of trying to treat a human or somebody on the right hand of the screen, is it possible to go back to the reservoir, the host, where the bacteria begins? In this case, it would be the mouse. So she patterned her research and her technology off of another product called Ravarol, which was a reservoir-targeted vaccine targeted preventing rabies. Similar in technology, what they did is they put baits out for the host of rabies, which were raccoons and skunks and wolves. And what they found out is during the course of the last 15 years, they've actually reduced human reported rabies in the United States to less than three cases in an entire year for the entire nation. So based on the success of those reservoir target vaccines, Dr. Gomes Lucky said, could I do the same thing with mice? And that's where she partnered with Dr. Osfeld, and they did their five years of CDC trials up in Millbrook to, to validate that assumption. So basically, in the graphic below, what she's done is she simply fed the mouse a vaccinated pellet, which then subsequently clears the mouse of the Lyme bacteria, which means when a tick feeds on that mouse, it doesn't attract that bacteria and subsequently it can't pass it on to 
a pet or a human or upstream. So that's what they tested, and I'll show you the lab results in just a moment, but they were very, very promising. And one other point that's important at the bottom of the screen is this is really a disease prevention platform, whereas we're starting with Lyme disease right now. We're already in discussions with other researchers to add anaplasmosis and other tick-borne disease of vaccines and preventives to the same pellet that we feed mice today. The Lyme Shield solution looks like this. It's uh, basically pet food. That's all it is. It's very safe. It's very effective. And again, I'll show you the results on the next slide. As far as being eco-friendly and you know, not changing the environment at all, that was the number one goal of Marie on the front end, and it had to be very cost efficient. So where she started, she said, it has to be safe because this will be distributed around playgrounds and campgrounds and other places where you'll have a lot of human interaction. So she achieved that goal. And she didn't want to increase uh, any of the animal population or decrease it. She wanted to leave it completely neutral and she accomplished that goal. And it was very effective in the, in the field trials and then exceptionally cost efficient. And the way it's made is we reached out to Perina. Uh, we were going to go through a host of different strategic partners to make the, uh, the substrate or the pellets. And Perina right away said, we want to be part of this. If this is a disease prevention platform and a strategic tool for the future, that's what we want to be associated with. So we work with them to create these pellets with no animal byproducts, no flavoring or anything. They're just grain-based, so it would be targeted directly to our mouse reservoir. And uh, then we worked with an animal health company called HESCA in the Midwest, and we're right in the middle of our USDA product approval right now, which should be complete this year. And uh, that, that whole process has been very positive. Everyone realizes the importance of Lyme prevention and the innovative technology that this can represent. So we, we've uh, had a great partnership with the USDA to date. And uh, like I said, hopefully everything will stay on track for product approval this year. Now the uh, field trial results are summarized on the slide that's in front of you right now. And if you'd like a copy of the specific uh, uh, published uh, peer review paper, I would be happy to send it to you. And I'll share my email address at the end of the visit so that you can send that directly to me. But let me give you the overview summary right here. And basically what they did is at the Cary Institute in New York, it was a five-year field trial where they had fields where they would put out uh, control baits without any vaccine in it. And so over the course of the year, the prevalence of infected ticks before the season and after the season actually went up 61% in the unvaccinated fields. A very significant increase, but it bears what we've seen with the CDC reports and the New York Public Health reports. And then in the fields that receive the vaccinated uh, baits, the level of infected mice and ticks actually went down to 76%, which is significant, obviously. So in control fields that didn't receive any uh, vaccine, uh, infected ticks went up 61%. And where they were, we did distribute the vaccine, it reduced 76%. So based on that, we moved quickly into the USDA approval process hopefully we'll be on track to help protect citizens as early as next year. Where would we start first? Uh, our initial focus has been on the public parkland because that's where we've seen the greatest uh, you know, interest from both the state and the federal government to date. And New York is probably a perfect example of that because you have over 60 million people visiting your parks each and every year. And the opportunity to make parks safer for every visitor would be, you know, our number one goal. And so that would be our phase one. Then we can expand into other public properties, and then we can expand into residential properties. Because what you obviously realize is that you can't just protect 
parks and you can't just protect the backyard. You have to, you know, be able to, you know, cleanse the environment of the bacteria for, for all areas that people would frequent. And when I talk about cleansing the area of bacteria, this is really similar to something like when you put Corel on your hands to get rid of the bacteria on your hands or Lysol on the kitchen counter just to clean the bacteria of the kitchen counter. That's all we're really doing, not changing the, uh, the ecology of the environment at all, just you know, taking out the harmful bacteria to protect pets and humans, of course. As far as distribution, this is a interesting graphic provided by Dr. Stafford of the life cycle of ticks. And again, focusing on the nymph ticks, which are the ones highlighted in those green bars in the center, they are very active June to the August time frame. So what we would do is simply distribute the lime shield product in the months of May, June, and July. And it would be similar to just a broadcast distribution of fertilizer or other product like that. You just pass it out along hiking trails around campgrounds or playgrounds or backyards, and that would actually you know, be consumed by mice within just a matter of a day or three, and then they get cleared, and that breaks the cycle of Lyme disease right at the very front end of the process. We actually did a follow-up test with Dr. Stafford in Reading, and I really like what he's doing right now, which he touched on earlier today in his presentation, whereas in the city of Reading, he's doing different combinations where he'll have control fields, He'll be doing certain areas where they're doing deer reduction, certain areas where they're doing combinations of different solutions. And uh, actually, he'll be testing not our original, because that's in the uh, USDA approval process right now, but a version two experimental version that's going to be even more interesting as we move forward. And what he discovered in his initial studies last year was when we put out the pellets without vaccine just to validate how much uh, it's consumed by mice, he had approximately a 90% consumption rate. Uh, and that was measured by biomarker, where we were able to coat the pellets with a special coating. We were able to see exactly which uh, reservoirs were consuming it at what levels. So to have a 90% uh, consumption rate uh, out of the shoots is, is very impressive, too. So I think our formulation is perfect. The vaccine's proven. Uh, Everything's lining up very nicely, and, and we're excited about our partnership with the state of Connecticut, and you know, just to test to see how our RTV or our Lime Shield fits in with all the other solutions. Because again, we truly think this is a collaborative solution to come up with the right mix to to have the optimal solution for each different area. Uh, as far as some recent recognition of note, uh, first on the center, that's the inventor. That's Dr. Maria Gomes-Lecki. She is great. Um, can't say enough great things about Maria. Her original research with Dr. Osfeld and the other industry leaders, and we have a strong ongoing partnership as she continues her, her research. And uh, the note on the left is where we were recognized as the number one new technology by the global Food and Health Innovation Challenge last year, and actually recognized on the House of Representatives floor for that technology achievement. And you'll see us written up more and more in the national press. And we aren't looking for that type of information or recognition yet. It'll come. We just want to be as logical as we can in getting the technology through the approval process and how to benefit the public in the right appropriate time frame. As far as the company leadership, uh, that's myself in the upper left-hand corner, but Chris Jubersheski and Dr. Steve Zaska, you know, head up our technology, lead in-house, and then you have Maria again. But let me introduce you to just four other key leaders. One is uh, Dr. Tom Monis, and we love Tom because he's a Harvard MD. He's in Boston, which obviously is a hotbed for Lyme disease, but he's also recently been recognized as a one of the top two men in vaccines in the world alongside Bill Gates. So to have someone with his stature, you know, 
following the technology and being as excited as Tom is, is is just I couldn't ask for a stronger science leader to come alongside us as a board member. And then Dave Williams uh, just retired as uh, CEO and and chairman of the board of Sanofi Pasteur, which is the largest vaccine company in the world. So you have a CEO of his stature, and we couldn't be more honored to have him on our board. And then Governor Thompson, you have uh, someone in a key line state like Wisconsin, and then also having him as U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, he appreciates you know, how important zoonotic diseases like Lyme disease are and what we can do together to help you know, with the prevention of that. And then one other company leader, um, Major General Bill Souter, he was one of the longest sitting Supreme Court clerks in, in the nation's history. So when you have representatives from the eastern seaboard, the upper Midwest, Dave's from Philadelphia, Tom is from Boston, they are the right senior leaders, you know, to really, you know, recognize this type of technology and, and help us be successful with important states like New York. And speaking about New York, uh, just another compliment to you guys. Uh, we work with 15 focus states, and, and they're all great, but just some of the names that uh, we've mentioned during the visit this morning, the Curie Institute with Dr. Osfeld, uh, can't say enough good things about his research, as I know you appreciate from his presentation. Uh, Maria Duke Wasser at uh, Columbia University, uh, um, Dr. Bigler at Cornell, who's actually very active also in the, uh, the RAPRAL or the rabies RTV programs. Dutchess County is probably one, if not the, most significant task force that we work with. And you can look at the others I have listed there, but in particular I might call out one or two, the New York uh, Association of Counties. We've met with every single county lead in the state of New York, New York, and they've asked us to come back in September and actually start to talk about distribution plans, things of that sort. So there's strong interest. As a matter of fact, we've never gone to a location where there's not an interest. Generally, people take the first few minutes of the visit to tell us about their own personal challenges or the challenges of their family or friends or relatives with Lyme disease. Uh, so but we, we couldn't be more happy to be in the right place at the right time. We're obviously working with the, you know, Senator, I mean, Representative Gibson and then the other folks uh, in New York, there are actually probably too many to put on one slide, but, but I think the important takeaway here is that there's a lot of stakeholders, and we absolutely appreciate everyone's viewpoint, and you have to get that on the front end if we're going to have a successful implementation. So that's very much what we look forward to accomplishing. And then in summary, uh, it, you know, New York is facing, you know, a crisis, of course. The whole Northeast is, and when you saw, uh, points that were shared earlier about changing ecologies, changing uh, weather patterns, you know, increased accounts, you know, it, there's no trend that's really reversing the trend, if you will, and that's what we would like to do. Uh, we have a product that's been proven actually to prevent uh, Lyme borreliosis in mice, and that's exciting. And I like the fact that we support biodiversity and healthy ecosystems. Again, we don't add anything to the environment. We don't take anything away except for the harmful bacteria. Uh, you know, one thing that we're really uh, cognizant of, it has to be very cost efficient because when you're looking at widespread distribution, you can't do certain pesticides, things like that, in a state park or in a playground area or camping ground. So it has to be something that's very easy to distribute, very cost efficient. We like the fact that it's a disease prevention platform, and basically when you look at mice and other small rodents like that, they're kind of syringes for diseases. And so if you can start with Lyme disease and then add extra protections and the additional versions that we have planned, that's exciting to me. And to have the ability to not only provide a strong public health benefit, but also an impactful financial savings for the states, uh, I, I couldn't ask for anything uh, that would accomplish any more important goals. So in closing, 
If you would like any additional information, please write down my email address. If you'd like copies of the published reports, I'd be honored to share it. If you'd like uh, me or any of the science team to come visit with any of your groups or talk to you over the phone or help you any way we can, we absolutely want to come alongside uh, New York and, and all the constituents in the upper and northeast and midwest and help you guys in every way we can. And with that, I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, I think it's my honor to actually introduce Andrew Sherman Roten who is uh, actually the Dutchess County Senior Public Health Advisor, and he's going to be doing the next presentation. And thank you again for your attention today. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Rotans. I'm from the Dutchess County Health Department. I'm here to talk to you about recent trends in tick-borne disease epidemiology. I'm going to be uh, focusing in on a national perspective uh, on numbers and then go to the New York State and then uh, do some local stats about some of the tick-borne disease you're well aware of. Uh, for the first slide here, uh, we talk about tick-borne diseases found in New York State. The ones that we do find in New York State are Lyme disease, Babesia, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Powassan virus, and Borrelia miyamotai. Um, but um, not found in New York State as of 2015 are some of the new ones, like two of them that are brand new are Heartland virus and Bourbon virus. Bourbon virus is very recent from uh, Kansas, the state of Kansas in Bourbon County, where uh, a gentleman passed away from that disease. But it's good to know that like, we do have common diseases that we're aware of, but also know that there are things and new things always coming with tick-borne disease. So let's talk about Lyme disease trends. Uh, national trends, cases of Lyme disease 2013, as you see, that's primarily focused in the northeastern United States and between Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, numbers have increased steadily um, to like over uh, near uh, over 30,000 in 2013 of uh, confirmed and probable cases. Um, what it is is like the CDC changed the definition of uh, and added probable cases to the definition in 2008, um, to and that would show like a, a, an increase in numbers. Um, as far as the reductions in, uh, in the United States as well, we have that bimodal distribution of, of uh, cases showing that there's a large surge of cases in early eight or for young people. And as uh, it goes down in teen years and then goes back up into the adult years and starts to wane for elders. In New York State, this is the Lyme disease numbers uh, that we see here. Um, like, uh, the interesting thing about this is to see the movement uh, many, many years ago, the, uh, the disease was primarily focused in the lower Hudson Valley and has moved up and is moving farther west. and. Um, as uh, the years move on. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay. And as far as Hudson Valley trends, the annual Lyme disease rates per 100,000 in the Hudson Valley. Um, Dutchess County is uh, is in the dark color there. And as you see, it seems to be going down, but partly because we do do a, a special kind of Lyme disease surveillance, which I'll touch upon in a minute. Um, as from this trend, as we see that uh, Putnam and Ulster and Orange seem to be, have more of the uh, trending cases in uh, the area. Um, a note, like I said, on sentinel surveillance, Dutchess is one of 19 counties that participates in the New York State Department of Health Lyme Disease Sentinel Surveillance Program. Uh, the counties with very high rates of Lyme investigate a sample of randomly selected case reports annually to determine it is, if confirmed a probable suspect or non-case. New York State Department of Health uses validated methods to project annual county totals from sentinel sample. Now we're going to touch upon babesiosis trends, um, national trends for babesiosis. Um, it became reportable 
only a couple years ago in um, 2011. So the numbers are still like starting to develop, but uh, as shown here is a map of the distribution of cases in 2012 with 911 confirmed cases of Babesia. Um, and as, as you see, the, like the numbers are steadily increasing as reporting becomes more common. In New York State, babesiosis was primarily in the beginning of the disease a problem in the Long Island area, but it has become endemic in the lower Hudson Valley and is moving up. Um, this is a map of cases of babesia. Uh, in the, it's mainly targeted in the lower Hudson Valley, sort of like the old pattern Lyme disease, and it seems to be moving up and over. As far as Hudson Valley trends, um, Putnam has the highest rate of infection for the lower Hudson Valley counties, um, but, and uh, we've had quite a, a movement of cases uh, uh, over the BZF, but we do get a significant number of cases in Dutchess County each year, about uh, 15 to 20 per 100,000 per year uh, is the case rate in Dutchess County. In New York State for anaplasmosis, again, maps showing this here uh, of the movement of anaplasmosis. Again, it's following the same trend as Lyme disease from 2005 to 2013, starting to move up north and probably starting to spread out to the west. In national trends for anaplasmosis, uh, you see that New York is one of the highest rates in the country, along where uh, probably where Lyme disease is as well. And annual cases steadily are rising for, uh, for anaplasmosis, formerly called human granulocytic or lichiosis. Uh, and like I said, we see like a, a movement upward. And even the incidence by age group as well is moving upward. Um, Hudson Valley trends of anaplasmosis. Um, again, it's been pretty steady. We've, uh, we've got like not a huge fluctuation numbers over the last of uh, three to four years. Um, Dutchess is one of the highest uh, rates of cases in the lowest Hudson Valley has traditionally had that over the years. Let's discuss ehrlichiosis trends. Um, nationally, again, ehrlichiosis tends to be in the Midwest uh, where ehrlichia chaffiensis was first noted to be. Um, again, the numbers are steadily rising over the years. And again, like uh, anaplasmosis, it tends to be a disease of people that are um, of, of adults and not of children. Okay. New York State ehrlichiosis numbers, again, not a lot of ehrlichia in Dutchess County. Um, we do get some cases of it. Uh, most of what we get in Dutchess County and in Lower Hudson Valley is um, anaplasmosis. The numbers probably are higher in the earlier years as we've developed better assays for discerning ehrlichia versus anaplasmosis. Uh, Hudson Valley trends for ehrlichiosis, again, rather low numbers, not, not huge numbers. Probably for every 10 cases of anaplasmosis, we have one case of ehrlichiosis reported in the lower Hudson Valley. Rocky Mountain speeder, spotted fever trends. Again, in, in New York, we have very low numbers of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It tends to be in the south and in the Midwest. Um, again, the, the numbers are increasing over years as awareness and reporting improves over, over time, and we start to see more cases. And again, it seems to be more uh, a disease of, of adults. Again, numbers very, very low in New York State of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Most cases seem to be uh, targeted in the Long Island region, which has been traditional. Uh, in the Hudson Valley, the rates are very, very low for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, um, such as, like, the highest is Sullivan County with 0.9 per 100,000 uh, persons, a very, very low rate. Powassan virus and deer tick virus. Again, the national trends, cases of Powassan virus reported by state, 
We've had 17 in New York State, where that's where most cases, uh, most cases have been reported, other than Wisconsin, Minnesota. Um, uh, the reported cases of virus, or virus seem to be on the increase over in the United States over years, and that's based on better uh, testing and better reporting of disease over time. Again, of the 19 cases reported in New York State from 2004 to 14, 14 have been residents of the Lower Hudson Valley, including three cases from Dutchess County. And most of the cases seem to be in Putnam County. In summary, the burden of tick-borne diseases has been increasing nationally and in New York State since the 1990s. The Hudson Valley continues to experience higher rate of, of most tick-borne diseases except Rocky Mountain spotted fever than the rest of upstate New York, but tick-borne diseases are slowly becoming more common elsewhere upstate. Lyme disease remains the most common tick-borne disease by five to ten times the rate of most the next most common tick-borne disease is anaplasmosis, the BZ, or Lickia, Rocky Mountain spotted and last spotted fever, and lastly, POW. Borrelia mimoti is not yet notifiable and currently extremely rare in the mm -hmm. three known, U.S., three known cases. But again, it's not commonly tested for. And for Q&A, contact information and disease reporting for Dutchess County, Dutchess County Department of Health, Communicable Disease Control Division, and this is my information if you have any questions about my presentation. And I'm going to be introducing Jill. I'm going to take a time out and then I have Jill Arbach to dial in. Um, While we wait for uh, Jill to come on, I, I hope that everyone is seeing the um, kind of dovetail for each one of our speakers. I think that uh, each PowerPoint and each presenter that we've had this morning, uh, we've seen some of the same slides that have been reoccurring, which are some of the very important slides. For example, the one that shows uh, the age groups uh, and by gender that are most susceptible to tick-borne disease. Uh, also hearing some of the uh, environmental factors and ways that we can help to uh, protect ourselves against tick-borne disease I think have been some definite overlaps. Um, I think Mason Kaufman's presentation gives us some hope uh, as well as uh, I think uh, we're going to hear from Mr. Whitman a little bit later and some things that maybe we can do out there to help protect those environments and reduce that risk uh, or exposure uh, to tick-borne diseases. So uh, I appreciate, again, all of the presenters that have presented this morning. I, I don't think that we could have made something that uh, we could actually organize it as well as it's actually flowed and the information has come out and actually uh, really been layered one right after the other. I thought Holly Ahorn's uh, presentation, uh, where it sat in the presentation, actually uh, then talked about you know the human piece. Uh, and we had already heard some of that information from some of our earlier presenters and it was just presented in a way that reinforced that. So as we're waiting for Jill to uh, come on, uh, we have just a few minutes here uh, while she's getting set up. Um, I'm uh, going to remind you again that if for any uh, reason you have questions, um, you can please submit those um, to D, that's Duchess County, so DC, Tickborn at Duchess ny.gov, and we will get those questions answered for you from those appropriate presenters. Our presenters uh, today have so far done a very nice job of giving uh, a slide that has the information or has the information slide as where you can contact them to get specific questions. But if you happen to miss one of those, uh, again, you can use that uh, email address. So at this time, we are going to go quiet for a couple of minutes while we're waiting for uh, Jill uh, to come on and be part of the conversation. And again, uh, I can't thank those presenters who have presented so far enough. And uh, we have some great presenters still left today. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Jill Auerbach. And I'm pleased to be here today to share this critically important information with you. 
This is about our struggle with ticks that infect us, our children, our pets, and wildlife with voracious diseases which can kill and can destroy lives and what we can do about them. Yes, let's take a bite out of Lyme disease. This is our Lyme and tick-borne disease challenge. Thank you, Captain Kirk. These are the issues I'll be sharing with you today. The cost burden of Lyme disease, the lack of research funding, an accurate Lyme test is severely needed, and the only way to stop ticks and stop disease is by either blocking their ability to infect us and or by reducing the tick numbers. Balanced research is the only way to solve this. This is a 40-year summary of where we have been for almost the past 40 years. Since um, Polly Murray found, uh, first found Lyme disease in Lyme, Connecticut. Patients suffer with no test to determine active disease, while ticks and disease increase, spread, and infect us. The scourge of disease will continue to increase unless the source of disease is addressed. There is no reliable test to determine who is actively infected, and tick numbers dramatically increase. Ticks have been spreading geographically. We have a multitude of virulent pathogens that have been discovered in the past 40 years, and these are some of them. The percentages of PAL pathogens have increased in the ticks as well. Dr. Bergdorfer, NIH research discoverer of the Lyme disease bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi in 1982, said in a 2007 interview several disturbing things. Quote, the Lyme disease spirochete is far more virulent than syphilis, end quote. Quote, the controversy in Lyme disease research is a shameful affair. And I say that because the whole thing is politically tainted. Money goes to people who have, for the past 30 years, produced the same thing, nothing. So the annual cases of Lyme disease in 2013 using the 10 times underreporting factor was over 300,000 that year, and it increases more each year that we go along. And the Lyme cost per case in 2013, including costs beyond just medical costs, was estimated at $10,769. So what does that amount to on an annual basis? Oh my goodness, it was over $3 billion. Well, I wonder how much is spent on research each year. I wonder if it's close to $3 billion. I rather doubt it. And by the way, the cost for New York State in 2013 with approximately 7,000 people was $7 million just in that year. The CDC surveillance case definition is intended to track disease progression, not individual case diagnosis. And these numbers do not include people who fall outside of that surveillance case definition but do have Lyme disease. These are the CDC reported numbers of people for the USA and New York State between 1990 and 2013. In 2013, the CDC stated that the number of cases were underreported by a factor of 10, making for over 1 million New York State residents who contracted Lyme disease during that time. Further, the CDC states from 10 to 20 percent, while others claim up to 50 percent, have lingering symptoms. Or are they treatment failures? That's a huge number of people remaining symptomatic. Does it matter what you call it? People are sick. 
There are high rates of other tick-borne diseases in ticks locally, many co-infected. Thus, one bite can transmit more than one disease at that time. This further complicates the diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. So how many people are left with lingering symptoms? What does it cost us? Families, healthcare, and public disability systems. At a minimum, it's 100,000 in New York State and a maximum 1 million people, showing that tick research would clearly be cost-effective. Chronic disease is a huge financial burden to society, consuming over 84% of our healthcare dollars. As you see in this, this Lyme survey and the NIH human research studies, it demonstrates that Lyme disease patients are included as chronic, chronically ill. Once again, this provides proof that tick research is cost effective. This is just an example of NIH funding for several reportable diseases in the year 2012. Notice Lyme had the lowest amount of funding at only $25 million, when HIV AIDS had $3 billion. And by the way, $25 million, and what did we say the course burden of Lyme disease was annually? Over $3 billion. It doesn't make too much sense, does it? And here we have $25 million. The lowest amount of funding, but oh my goodness, Lyme has the largest number of cases annually, and that's not even including the other tick-borne diseases. Two thousand and thirteen was the last reportable year, so what occurred then? Oh my, an increase of fifty thousand cases in the United States. Well, maybe the funding increased. Oh my, it didn't. It decreased by $5 million. That's a decrease of 20%. The U.S. CDC and NIH has done nothing effective in all these years to improve the plight of patients. They're still suffering. And this is especially true in regard to tick prevention and tick-borne disease protection. And not even a gold standard test is available as there is for HIV AIDS which, as a matter of fact, let patients and physicians know who is infected or not, and that would put an end to the Lyme wars. By the way, of the 25 million, only a pittance is spent on tick research. The scourge of tick-borne disease will never end until the tick problem is addressed with funding. Researchers must compete each year for the shrinking pot of governmental funding by submitting proposals to stay in business. So yes, the researchers you heard from, Dr. Mathers, Dr. Osfeld, and Dr. Stafford, every year have to submit proposals. And it's a shrinking pot of money, so they never know whether they're going to be able to stay in business. This is not right. The lack of funding has caused a huge problem in that the competition affects cooperation negatively, and no one new comes into this field because there's no money for them. As researchers have been retiring, their knowledge base is lost. The dire need for funding is an area we all agree upon, researchers and advocates alike. The most promising field of science needs funding to bring solutions to fruition. The anti-tick research that would have stopped disease cold in its tracks by preventing these ticks from remaining attached, thus their ability to transmit pathogens, is no longer funded. A side effect is if they can't feed, they will die, thus reducing tick numbers. This technology is far from dead, and many researchers are very excited about it. But we must get funding for this anti-tick vaccine research to become fruitful. It is absolutely 
the best solution to the tick problem. Although currently available are carotide sprays effectively kill ticks, many have concerns about using them. Aerial sprays for mosquitoes are used, while a low controlled ground spray is all that is needed for ticks. Likewise, the tick boxes are effective, yet none of these can be used everywhere. Thus, it takes coordination of what is good for differing situations. For instance, your yard versus parks and woodlands. There have only been small area studies, such as on islands, um, as you have seen from Dr. Stafford's um, presentation. It's really time for the federal, state, and local governments to fund meaningful large research projects, which would affect, say, an entire county, such as Duchess, and incorporate all of these together to see what it actually does to reduce disease. And it would be cost effective. People and other animals suffer while science, government, and doctors debate. If it were so simple, would Joseph have died of undiagnosed, untreated, disseminated Lyme disease the summer of 2013 after about a month of illness? So there clearly is physician over-reliance on an inaccurate test. Even though the CDC has made it clear that test results are not to be used as diagnostic in early Lyme disease. So my question to you is, do you think 17-year-old Joseph would have died if the test accurately let the doctor know he was positive for Lyme disease? I don't. These are some pictures of our magnif magnificent but treacherously tick-infested Hudson Valley. Dr. Osfeld reported on just how infected ticks are locally with so many pathogens. Will you or your family escape unscathed? Now about ticks and mosquitoes. We all know how concerned our country is about mosquitoes, and they certainly are a serious problem worldwide. However, are you aware that tick diseases, in fact, infect far more people than mosquito diseases in the United States and in North America? Yet the funding doesn't even come close. There's a huge amount for mosquitoes, while only a pittance for ticks. When a three-year-old has 32 nymphal ticks removed from her body after visiting a local park, you know it's way past time to do something about the tick infestation. And this, the walkway over the Hudson, our newest park, is probably our only tick-free zone. It's impossible to totally avoid ticks. Exposure to ticks must be reduced or the scourge of disease will continue to increase. Just an experience that I had. I got into my car in the garage, drove to my friend's house, got out, walked up her front walk into her home, sat down for a cup of coffee, and she said to me, Jill, there's a tick crawling up your leg. So I ask you, given the current environment, how do you prevent that? I don't know. And as a matter of fact, you know, People just simply don't follow all the precautionary things all the time. You know, you're having somebody come in for um, company, you just want to run out and grab a flower. Are you going to dress and spray yourself and then shower afterwards? I don't think so. Our children, our most precious future resource, are most at risk. They should be able to play safely outdoors, roll in the grass, jump in the leaves without getting sick like we could as children, or at least I could. So what is Congress doing for us? H.R. 4701, the Tick-Borne Disease Research Transparency and Accountability Act of 2014, was a bipartisan bill authored by Congressman Gibson for the government to adopt a more aggressive strategy to improve detection, treatment, and prevention of these tick-borne diseases. This legislation requires action from the research community. An interagency working group to assure balanced research consisting of federal agencies and non-federal partners, including experienced Lyme physicians and patient advocates, among others. 
By the way, in 2015, Bill HR 789 is being worked on. We hope for a same as bill in the Senate that will become law signed by the President. U.S. Representatives Smith of New Jersey and Peterson of Minnesota are co-chair of the House Lyme Disease Caucus. It's a bipartisan organization dedicated to educating members of Congress and staff about Lyme and other tick-borne disease. Well, it's evident that the U.S. governmental agencies have done nothing much effective in all of these years to improve the plight of patients. This is especially true, I say again, in regard to tick protection and tick-borne disease prevention. We hope for a law that addresses this problem. So what can you do to help? Use this link below to contact your U.S. senators and con congressmen. It's up to you to speak up. They want to be reelected, and they're going to pay attention when they hear from their constituents. Convince them to advocate for us, just like New York State Congressman Chris Gibson, Sean Patrick Maloney, and New Jersey Chris Smith do. We need to elect representatives who care about us. The scourge of tick-borne disease will never end until the tick problem is addressed by governmental funding. We need an accurate test. We need to block tick's ability to infect us, and we need to reduce its tick numbers. Tell them, your U.S. senators and congressmen, and your state and local reps, that you want tick reduction research now. It's way past time for it. This is where you can be powerful and take control so we can all safely enjoy our environment. We're powerful when we all work together. Please do this now. Well, indeed, it is tick time. I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss some prevention tips right now. It's the only thing we have in our bag of tricks. Ticks climb up onto brush or grass up to about a two to three feet in height. And they're just hanging out there waiting to grab onto an animal for its next blood meal. So if you're going for a hike or walking around, stay in the center of paths to make certain that animal isn't you. As far as clothing goes, all of these suggestions are great. Number six, now when we talk about repellents, for children you must be careful. With adults, often DEET is used on the skin. For clothing, there's a chemical derivative of the chrysanthemum called permethrin, which is very effective in killing ticks on your clothing and lasts through repeated washings. You can purchase it and spray it on your own clothes or buy clothing that's impregnated. Since ticks crawl upward from the ground, remember to spray your shoes and socks. And with any of these, remember to read and follow the directions on them. And by the way, um, permethrin is available in um, many sporting goods stores and outdoor stores. Just tell them you want to spray for your clothing and look for the word permethrin on it. Um, you would use it um, outdoors when there is no wind blowing. Spray your clothes down let them dry, and then, as I said, through repeated washing. So if you use certain clothing for your yard work, that would be an effective set of clothing to make certain that is um, kept um, protected. Now, don't forget your pets. Check with your veterinarian. Using more than one type of, of protection can be toxic to them. Number eight addresses tick checks, but I add to it. It's critical to remove a tick as promptly as possible. It's rare for Lyme to be transmitted to you less than 24 hours. However, other tick-borne diseases can be, and at times, um, although very rare, Lyme can be. So daily tick checks are the rule on any day where the temperature is above, 80 degree, uh, above 40 degrees, excuse me, because ticks are active. Another tip. Ticks die if their bodies dry out. So when you come indoors, go to your dryer, strip off your clothing, my grandson laughed at that, and place them in it on a high heat for at least 20 minutes. Then take a brisk shower to remove any ticks that are loose. 
Tick removal information is here, um, is good here. Be certain to be close to the skin because if you grab it in the middle, you'll squeeze, you'll squeeze the infectious organisms into yourself. This is the only safe way to remove a tick. Other ways expose you to infection or injury. Additionally, the mouth parts are barbed like a fish hook, and the tick cements this into you. Thus, when you pull them out, you may feel some resistance. If this tiny part breaks off, it is non-infectious and is like a splinter. Wipe it off with an antiseptic. The glue-like substance holding it will dissolve, so it will come out soon. Save the tick in a baggie or a small jar with some alcohol for identification purposes. Earlier presentations today were by experts in the field. They may have covered some of this. Please avail yourself of Dr. Stafford's Tick Management Handbook and Dr. Mather's website, the Tick Encounter Organization, for the best in protection currently available. The next stage is making sure that we have larger research studies, that there's funding for this. So please, as I said before, call your representatives, local, state, and federal, and tell them you want funding to stop the ticks. Be tick safe, be tick smart, and be safe this summer. Thank you for tuning in and listening. I hope you found this information useful to you. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions for me, um, you can reach me on my home phone, which is 845-454-9414, or right into the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, next will be uh, David Whitman. Um, who has done a lot on, on uh, tick management and control, and he has the tick boxes. So I leave you with him. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Whitman, president of the Tick Box Technology Corporation, manufacturer of the Select TCS Tick Control System, a host targeted bait box acaricide delivery system. Along with my brother and partner, Richard, we have served as consultants in the early development of the bait box technology in the field as it relates to the commercial application of the product going back to 1999. We have worked hand-in-hand -hand with Dr. Mark Dolan and Gary O'Malpin from the CDC, Drs. Terry Schulze and Bob Jordan from New Jersey Health Departments, as well as Dr. Kirby Stafford from the state of Connecticut and countless others. My brother and I also were hands-on contributors on the development teams of Aventus Environmental Science and of course Bayer Environmental Science. We also developed and are the manufacturers of the two-piece metal shroud to protect the plastic bait box from chewing animals such as gray squirrels. The Select TCS bait box technology was invented developed, tested, and proven effective by scientists and researchers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Select TCS kills ticks during the critical larval and nymph stages when they are contracting the Lyme bacterium and other tick-borne infections from small rodents such as white-footed mice and the eastern chipmunk, thus interrupting the transmission cycle of Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. The Select TCS Tick Control System is an easy to use, low maintenance, effective treatment to reduce tick populations and the risk of contracting Lyme disease. The Select TCS Tick Control System is a non-serviceable, disposable, self-contained, child-resistant product. It is installed and secured to the ground within a two-piece metal protective cover mitigating any chewing animal damage. The bait boxes are placed around the perimeter borders of a home or school to attract the mice and chipmunks. The bait boxes contain a non-toxic bait block attractant which entices the rodents to enter the bait boxes. In order to collect its food, the mice and chipmunks must rub against a wick that applies a low dose of an acaricide known as fipronil to its fur, 
The rodents exit the bait box unharmed as the fipronil quickly works to kill any ticks the rodents may be carrying. The fipronil continues to kill ticks for many weeks after the initial application. The bait boxes are deployed in the spring to kill the emerging nymphs and are placed in the summer to kill the emerging larvae. The bait boxes are then recovered in the fall after the second 90 days of treatment. The Select TCS Tick Control System is registered with the US EPA and in 26 states and its registration number is 85306-1. The Select TCS Tick Control System is labeled for use by pesticide management professionals and public health department personnel for the control of ticks which may carry Lyme disease. This is very important as a municipality can purchase the product and install the bait boxes at schools, parks, work sites, or recreational properties, eliminating the need to hire private contractors to provide the service. Providing the bait box product is installed as per the product label instructions and not within a school's playground, the bait boxes can be used at schools as permitted by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. The bait box product is registered in the state of New York as a public health pesticide product and is classified as a restricted use product. A licensed pesticide professional or public health department personnel maintaining a public health category 8 license can install the product. Based on CDC data, select TCS can reduce tick populations by nearly 80% and decrease the percentage of infected ticks to just 7% after just one year. CDC field trials show the total number of developing ticks can be reduced by 97% and reduce the remaining infected population to less than 2% by the end of the second year of treatment. In closing, the Select TCS Tick Control System is an efficacious and responsible alternative to traditional tick control spraying and broadcast pesticide applications. The tick box system interrupts the Lyme disease cycle without harming wildlife, damaging the environment, or threatening the health of one's family with high-dose pesticides. More information about our product can be found at www dot tickboxtcs dot com. Thank you. We thank uh, David Whitman for providing the uh, information on tickbox technology. Um, at this time, we're going to move into a pre-recorded um, presentation from Dr. Fallon. Uh, he's the director of Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Research Center at Columbia University. And uh, we uh, really thank him for providing us with this. We couldn't um, find a time schedule that would fit him today for him to do the webinar live. So again, this is a pre-recorded uh, presentation that we will begin now. Thank you.